Hello and good afternoon, Hackaday. All right. Oh, this just skipped one slide. Okay. All right. Um, so before I begin, this talk is a result of you know a, a building on the results of a lot of people here. The first acknowledgement I want to give is to Jeremy's blog, IOSoft, which is kind of like the authoritative source of information about the Raspberry Pi SMI. Because the talk that I'm about to give is, is as much as about the Raspberry Pi as it is about the Pico, because you have both halves of the same thing. So there have been existing logic analyzer implementations with the Pico, which I have taken the luxury to look at and see how they have implemented things. Uh, the Pico documentation itself was like a mine of knowledge and you know an example of you know how well things can be documented and uh, hidden Easter eggs. Uh, my family, who has been extremely supportive uh, back in India as well as external relatives here in the U.S., whom I stayed with, and at the conference, I also want to thank Magenta, uh, the team of Supply Frame volunteers who helped me so much with my talk. And a special mention to Susan, Rob, and uh, a friend who helped me right at midnight to get the hat, the, uh, the, this one, up and running. So uh, with this, uh, let's begin with the talk. A little bit about me. Uh, uh, I started electronics at a very early age. You know, I was about seven or eight years old in that first pick. I learned how to design boards. I've done a lot of soldering. I've done some micro soldering also of QFN packages. This was like about 10 years ago. That's my family electronic shop. I mean, where I used to go to at my hometown. So I grew over the years. The shop stayed like, you know, <laughs> And uh, what I missed during my early ages was a community because uh, at my age, I was probably the only one in my city or, you know, uh, doing all these things. The first time I was introduced to Hackaday was when I realized that, you know, there are other people in the world who do what I do and they enjoy it. And, uh, you know, uh, I started, you know, getting connected to them. The next thing I'm probably known for is Beagle Logic. So this is uh, this was my summer of code project in 2014 with BeagleBoard. Uh, it turns the BeagleBoard into a logic analyzer, but this like a custom implementation of the board with some level shifters. This went up to the best product in 2017 at the Hackaday Prize, but I did not productionize it. The reason being that uh, I. Uh, was not happy with the performance of this thing uh, with Ethernet. And uh, uh, the price at which it would have gotten sold, uh, I mean, you would have gotten like higher spec computers at, at the same price. So I felt it did not justify it. So after waiting a few generations, of course, we now have bigger and better Beagle boards. And uh, that means that, you know, Beagle Logic can make a comeback with uh, some better hardware. So do watch out over there. But uh, I guess that's where we are. Uh, I work for Google today. I used to work for analog devices three years back. And uh, I've also been an intern at Google in 2016. So what I'm going to talk about is yet another Pico-based logic analyzer. But you may ask, what's the difference between this one and the ones that came before this. So the Pico just has 256 KB of RAM. It doesn't have a full-fledged memory controller. So you're always limited by the amount of RAM inside the Pico, even if you want to sample at 100 mega samples a second, and how many other channels you want to sample. If you want to get it out of there, you, uh, the fastest thing you have is the USB interface uh, that will get you somewhere around like one megabytes per second-ish. So the idea here is that uh, you combine a high-speed interface with the Pi with the Pico, and the Pico can sustain that throughput in order to stream samples directly to the Pi. And then what you get is uh, 
the sample storage as much as you want in the Pi, and in theory, if you could, you could probably even saturate the SSD if you, if you, if you wanted. But I'm not yet there at, at that point. Like right now, the speed that I am at is about 40 megahertz-ish, 16 bits. Uh, but the plan is to go up till 100 mega samples a second or 125 mega samples a second. Uh, let's see if I can get there. Uh, but uh, we also have the Pi 5, which was announced right in between when I was preparing for my talk. And that kind of, you know, uh, shifted things around a bit. So at the end of the talk, I'll also talk like, uh, how can this be implemented on the Pi 5? Uh, so the MVP, the, the minimum amount of hardware you need to implement this is just the Raspberry Pi board and one RP2040 chip, no flash memory. So, uh, and if you are just dealing with 3.3 volt signals, you don't even need a level shifter. Uh, the hat that I have built for this thing, it basically has ESG protection over here, it has 16 inputs, uh, it has an EEPROM, it has the uh, Pico, of course. It has a level shifter for five volts. Uh, this here is a, a adjustable LDO that can shift between 3.3 volt and 1.8 volt logic signals. Uh, so that's what uh, this is organized as. But uh, uh, if you just wanted, you could just do it with the with the RP2040 chip and the Pi itself. Uh, so the original idea was actually to just use the Pico itself. I mean, I never wanted to use the chip. But uh, the Pico comes with tw 26 usable GPIOs, and uh, the PIOs can only work with 30 out of, uh, like, the 36 that the Pico has. Uh, so we can't really do 16 in and 16 out. So, the PI so we can't build a pipeline just using the PIOs if you, if you, if you want to have 16 channels in and out. Uh, so, but in theory, we could probably also try doing, you know, 16 in and 8 out. Uh, this could happen, but at half the speed, because uh, ultimately you need to, like, you know, you can't, uh, you have to work at that, but then maybe you will not be able to reach 100 mega samples a second, and my target was to, you know, somehow reach that magic figure. So how do we get there then? For that, uh, remember we have 36 GPIOs. So th we have the single cycle I.O. controller, that, that's the SIO. And then we also have the uh, PIO. So maybe we can have the SIO control the 16 and the PIO control the other, the other 16. But wait, now the SIO has two banks. The 30 GPIOs are connected to one bank. The quad SPI six pins go to the other bank. So how do you sample them simultaneously? Uh, well, the Pi has, the Pico has two cores, right? We could probably use them independently and then synchronize them somehow. Uh, so we will figure that out. And uh, if I click on this, this is how well I was able to synchronize them. So you see, both the cores are independently tog toggling two different GPIOs, and my scope is doing 500 mega samples a second, and uh, the, like it's almost there within a margin of error. So this is doable. Uh, like you, you can have both the core samples simultaneously and more or less at, 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 at the same time. So with that being said, uh, we can continue further. So yeah, let's make the two core sample GPIs every clock cycle. We have a LDR instruction that uh, on running on both the cores independently. But uh, having a single cycle clock access has a cost that you can't do DMA on the SIO. You cannot connect the SIO to the DMA directly because it is directly connected to the CPU. So our data path can't be SIO to DMA to PIO. So the two CPUs have to somehow orchestrate SIO to RAM, the DMA picks up the data from the RAM and puts it into the PIO, and then the PIO has to then clock out that data into the Pi as the SMI interface requests data from it. Now, some math to figure out you know, how much uh, we can achieve 
uh, as a function of f clock. So if we make a table, uh, at t is equal to zero, we have the LDR instruction. At t is equal, like after one clock cycle, we do some magic to combine data. And then we have to write data back to RAM. That will take us two cycles. The ST instruction takes two cycles. And then we also have to do a branch back. That will take another two cycles on the ARM course. Uh, so the thing is, now, uh, like, you can see that basically, if I were to run the Pi or the Pico within spec at 185 megahertz, reaching 100 mega samples a second is not possible. But the Pico can be overclocked, right? So, <laughs> so uh, the fastest I have tried to test the Pico as of now, as of this morning, was 300 megahertz, and it seems stable. It seems stable. I'm going to try and overclock it further. But uh, let's see what happens. Let's see you know, how far I, I can push the boundaries. Because I know that the publicly documented figure is somewhere around 420 to 450 megahertz for, for the Pico. And I don't want to use liquid nitrogen. <laughs> so uh, the other thing is, we have 16-bit data, but 32-bit of writes. So in theory, uh, one write takes two cycles, but we can push that two bits of data. So the cost can be amortized. So instead of like having this loop for like one sample branch, we can like combine two or combine four, and, and we can do more. I actually have all these uh, like calculations and pipelining in my notebook, but I was not able to like digitize it and put it on slide. But you can come and see me whenever you want. The other thing is, Getting data from one core to the other is only possible by the FIFOs. So you also need to consider that as like one clock cycle. So uh, core one would send uh, like one block in one clock cycle. Uh, it would be available at core zero at the next clock cycle. So basically, according to my calculations, like the maximum I was able to get in theory was F clock by four like you know, trying to put all the delays, all the writes, uh, combining all the data. And I do also use the interpolator in the, in the Pi, like in the Pico. Because the interpolator uh, has the block that lets you uh, write shift the data and mask the data. So basically, uh, like as I have laid out the pins, I can do a write shift by some amount and you know, move it to like the lower half of the 16 bits. I can do another shift and move it to the higher half. So uh, that way, and then uh, get data from the other core, do a logical OR, and then send it back to RAM. So like that's how the loop is. I know it's like tedious ARM assembly, and I haven't written it all out, but like that's what the plan is. Uh, the other thing we have to do deal with is the bus contention in the CPU. Uh, like, what happens if core 0 and core 1 try to write things together? What happens if the DMA tries to read from the same place where core 0 has just written data at? So the thing about the Pico is that you see you have uh, four RAM banks. You have another two RAM banks. So the way it happens that every four bytes go on like striped across RAM banks. So basically, address x is uh, in, say, SRAM 0. Then address x plus 4 is going to fall in SRAM 1. So if you could kind of you know, arrange things a little bit, you could have the crossbar and like, assuming each thing is accessing every other thing independently, everything could go on in concurrence. Like no one steps on each other's toes, basically. And, uh, and how do we verify, actually, that uh, you know, the arbiter is not kicking in and we are not actually doing this? So the solution is, in the data sheet, you have these things called as the bus performance counters. So uh, you could program one of these counters, and you could probably check if the arbiter has ever kicked in in your sampling cycle. And then you know that whatever data you have sampled is, can possibly be garbage because you miss something somewhere. Uh, so yeah, uh, we have some hand-tuned ARM assembly. 
Here I've written that we'll return here post-exploring, but uh, the slides don't have space for that, I'm sorry. Uh, the peak was running o o overclocked now. We have talked about it. We load samples to RAM. We arm the DMA controller. The, <laughs> the PIO is ready to clock out data from the Pi via the SMI, and autopull seems to uh, function reasonably OK, so far as they've tried. So let's now go to the Pi and see how things work there. Um, all right. So uh, the SMI has a smidgen of documentation. Very little said about it in public. The first Google search is, of course, his blog. Uh, the second uh, beneficiary of the SMI uh, is the Caribulite uh, uh, SDR hat. They had a, some kind of like an extracted data sheet of the SMI, which they later removed from the Git repos. But you can, of course, go back then in history and find it. <laughs> so um, assuming they don't scrub the Git repository. Uh, and then, uh, but then the blog is actually like by far like the most uh, comprehensive uh, documentation. And there's also a kernel driver, which actually turned out to be relatively easy to use, surprisingly, even though it's not so well documented. Uh, so uh, when using the SMI, here are the challenges that you have to contend with. So the blog did, uh, described three challenges the bus turnaround, uh, you have to kind of like avoid logic contention, we'll get to that in the next slide, then the bus maximum throughput, and sustenance without interruptions. And these are the things that I found. One is data integrity, so set up hold and uh, clock domain crossing, because the Pi and the Pico are running separate independent clocks. Uh, signal integrity, uh, debugging, and uh, flow control for uh, variable sample rates. The last one I haven't been able to work out yet, but I'm, like, I have made some progress, so let's see. Uh, so this is what was documented on the blog. Uh, Jeremy had a ADC board uh, that would uh, send data into the SMI. So you can see that the SOE uh, line, so the output enable. So on every falling edge of the SOE, uh, uh, the Pi is expected to become a receiver of da uh, data and it would sample whatever is there on the data lines. So at the rising edge of SOE is when the, like this is from the data sheet, it says BCM2708, but it can be like any peripheral because the peripheral is the same, which are the Pi you're looking at. So the data is actually lashed at the rising edge and then you have the R setup, the R strobe, and R hold, and R pace. You can program all of these via the SMI registers. And uh, if you are using the kernel driver, you can use the IOCTL to easily do, uh, do this. So the fastest sustainable thing I found was a one-to-one -one, uh, cadence of setup, strobe, and hold. A uh, pace does not come into the picture because you are holding the same address. So if you would, for example, change addresses, uh, but since we j just have the Pico, we don't have to de deal with that. So uh, successive accesses can go on. So the data rate is F SMI, the frequency at which the SMI is operating, by, by four. So if your SMI inside the Pi is running at 500 megahertz, you can have a 125 megahertz SOE toggling and then uh, the Pico would po possibly, if the Pico can handle that, it can shift out data fast enough. So in theory, the Pico should be able to do it, but that's something I have to verify. The fastest I've gone so far is 41.666 megahertz, which is 125 by three. Uh, FSMI, like, is, de is de derived from a 750 megahertz PLL inside the Pi, and that has a fractional clock divider. So we can easily uh, you know, try and reach whatever clock speeds we want. Uh, so the thing is, I then started to think, how would I address the bus turnaround problem? Like, you see the bus conflict that happens there when uh, SOE goes high, then the Pi tries to drive the bus, and the ADC also tries to bus in, in the opposite direction. 
So how to avoid that contention? So the first idea was that let's use a 245 buffer. So between the Pi and the Pico, have the OE lines connected, have the, have the data lines connected, and uh, the OE would trigger, like every OE uh, falling edge would enable the buffer and disable the buffer. So uh, I extracted this from the data sheet. It turns out that the time it takes to, from the input to go to high impedance down to uh, valid, or from uh, valid to high impedance, is roughly four to five nanoseconds max. Of course, your chip can be faster than that, but uh, process uh, variations mean that you never know. You have to take the worst case into account. So you can't really like, hit the uh, 100 megahertz uh, time limit over here. The next thing we could possibly try is a faster chip. Uh, so this could possibly be something like a LSF0104 or a LSF0108. So this is a transmission gate style uh, level shifter. So it doesn't have the CMOS gate, it just has like a MOS between one line and the other line. And you have like eight, eight matching MOSFETs and you have one matching MOSFET on top biasing all the eight MOSFETs. So basically, assuming the Pico pulls its end low, the MOSFET conducts and it pulls the other end low as well. If the Pi pulls its end down, uh, the Pico end will get pulled down because the MOS is gonna conduct. Or there's like a passatic diode in between. So, uh, so yeah, like uh, that's how this thing functions. And uh, uh, while this will not prevent the contention, it will just ensure that uh, one thing is, this is open drain level shifting. So you need to have like around 100 ohms pull-ups on both sides. So this will consume a bit more current. But then uh, you won't really have the contention because current will always have a path to go through, if, even if the contention ever happens. So this is a better solution, but not the best. So yeah, uh, I went through all of these points. Uh, but can we do better? The thing is, uh, the PIUs are the ones which are actually uh, driving everything. But if you read the data sheet, it turns out that PIUs can not only drive the IO levels, they can also turn around the pin direction. So you can make the pins in and out according to the, like whatever data you are trying to latch into the PIUs. So we could possibly use this. Uh, so if we could run like a small program on one of the other state machines that uh, monitors the OE and makes sure to kind of, you know, uh, turn the bus around, we could possibly work around this. Uh, it's not as easy as it sounds. We can save on the bomb as well, as will fire design. That's an interesting prospect. But I spent around two, three days uh, head scratching on this, and uh, it turns out that uh, the simplest way uh, is not possible, and what's possible uh, is okay enough, but we could have done better. And uh, after, uh, after this was implemented, uh, contention is not really observed on the scope, so this seems to work okay. Uh, so the side set, on the PIOs. So every PIO instruction has a side set which can either drive your pins or your pin DIRs. So the side set uh, could possibly, you know, uh, the first thing was, you know, uh, just side set all 16 to one or zero. But it turns out that side set can only drive five pins at a time. You can't drive more than five pins at a time through side set because uh, that's how the PIO instruction set is structured. You can only have five bits for the side set. So workarounds, one was brute force. Use three state machines to drive five pins each and have like the remaining one state machine drive the one pin. Or maybe just you know, balance it out and uh, have four cross four. There is 
another thing I discovered in the data sheet, which is called the sticky mode in the, PI in the PIUs. And there is also the concept of priorities when you have four state machines inside each PIO block. So the thing is, if, PI, if the zero, it's like if the first state machine and the fourth state machine both try to drive different GPIOs at the same time, the values of the higher valued state machine will take effect. So SM1, SM2 drive something at the same time, it's SM2's values which will actually appear outside on the pins. So you have this, this priority stuff going on. And then there is something called as the stickiness. And then there's also the concept of a enable bit in the PIO uh, uh, outputs. The way enable, pin, enable bit works is that you can define some pin in the 32-bit space. And you can say that it's the enable pin. So if you write a value that has the enable bit set, you, uh, that PI, it, it will behave as if that PIO was never written a value. So that's a pretty interesting thing I found. I thought this might help me implementing stuff, but uh, it kind of seemed to involve priority inversion. So let's say I have PIO zero uh, set things like enable the outputs. Now I want to have PIO1 uh, disable them. And I want to have PIO2 enable them back again. So uh, like the priority has to be inverted somehow, and I can't keep doing that again and again. So this solution wouldn't really work out after a lot of head scratching. So what, uh, and the other thing is, the only way to set 16 consecutive bits uh, in pin DIRs is via the out instruction. And the out instruction involves the output shift register. And every time you write something from that, you consume the value within it. So you need to constantly reload values within it if you, if you want to use it. So my final implementation uses two state machines uh, and then you have one state machine for like transferring data into the SMI interface. So one state machine out of those two waits for the falling edge of OE, and it sends the pin as outputs so that the signal can appear. The other state machine waits on the rising edge and sets the pin as inputs, removing the thing. So uh, out gets reloaded uh, after that in the next instruction. So let's... Uh, so far, we had been talking about the control plane uh, or like the data path, like how the data would flow from the, uh, the Pico to the Pi. Let's now talk a little bit about uh, how the Pico is controlled by the Pi itself. That's the control path or the control plane. So we are al already using the SIO quad spy pins as our inputs. So it's out of the picture to have any kind of program already stored on the Pi, on the Pico. So uh, we just run, run off the RAM. Who loads the firmware? Well, we have the Pi. The Pi can run GDB server, it can run open OCD, and it also has a driver for the GPIOs for the Raspberry Pi. So we have two spare GPIOs on the Pi, we just connect them to the SW clock and the SW DIO of the Pico. And now we get full control over the chips, RAM, the chips execution. We have GDB, we have breakpoints, we, we get a lot of things for free. And then I even tried the RTT protocol and it works reasonably well. So that, that could also be like a potential uh, control path when this thing is kind of like, you know, productionized. So uh, right now, the only GDB server that supports native GPIO is uh, OpenOCD. Uh, I also looked at PyOCD and ProbeRS. I want to use ProbeRS. 
but both of them need a USB debugger. But why would you want to use that if you just have everything on the GPI itself? So the plan is to switch to ProBaris if support gets integrated. There is already a pull request in the works, and uh, if I can get something there, maybe it will work. Uh, okay, I have 10 minutes, but okay. Uh, so now we have the, uh, the host software. So the host software, uh, it uses uh, Rust to uh, read from the SMI interface. So it's, so it's like, you know, um, Rust is pretty popular, and for me it was also like a learning and exploration exercise as to how I could try and, you know, learn Rust, use it as a thing to learn it. So I ultimately want to make it like an end-to-end Rust stack using ProBaris and then RTT and uh, possibly uh, like even have the firmware in Rust, but that's like, you know, uh, too much ahead. Right now, the SDK of the Pico works really well. So uh, the sample program uses the SMI kernel driver. It makes some ioctals to configure the SMI and then it reads it back. This is actually a simpler approach than doing the memory mapping and DMA stuff in user space. And of course, you can always mmap and use Rust and Safe to uh, get to uh, things when you want. Okay. So next we have, yeah, so next we have use of ChatGPT. This seems to have skipped the slide. Yeah, so the thing is, I wanted to, you know, convert some uh, C code to use Rust, and I wanted to have like a neat struct. So I told, hey, ChatGPT, please uh, give me a struct based on these offsets and ratio definitions, and this is what it came up with, which is pretty impressive. So uh, the next thing I tried was to kind of like uh, use it to figure out some GPIO stuff. So I actually did not paste the whole prompt in there. Uh, I wanted to paste that, you know, uh, give me some Python code that I can use to parse this. But even with this information, this is what it kind of like came up, came up with, which is also impressive. And then here you have like uh, you can use Python's bitwise to unpack. So basically, uh, given the value of a GPIO register, I could like easily view what alternate function it was using and everything. So I kind of discovered an interesting use of uh, large language models that they are like pretty effective at uh, digesting memory maps from PDFs, register maps from PDF, and then making you simple utilities that you can use to parse those values and then use it practically. Yeah, uh, let's continue. So uh, overall system design, this is what we have. We have the Pi, we have the Pico, uh, we have 16 data lines, we have a OE, we have DREC and DREC ACK, which is used for flow control, which is not yet fully implemented. We have SW clock and SWDIO. And then I also have a provision for connecting the GP clock of the Pi into the Pico. So in theory, we could also do it with the crystals on the Pico. Have the Pi provide the clock to uh, the Pico, so that would further optimize the bomb cost. Um, then, uh, yeah, this is what I designed. Uh, I guess I have already explained the features more or less. Um, I ordered this thing when I was boarding my flight to the US for the super conference, like right at the airport gate when everybody was entering the aero bridge and uh, the orders went through. I received the boards on 1st of November, right before I came here for the, sort of, for the super conference. The parts is a whole another story. I had to go to the FedEx warehouse in Los Angeles and then come back to the city to figure out that they had kept it somewhere in, in, in the city and then retrieve it because otherwise it, it would have reached me on Monday. I would have been no use. Last evening, many of you would have seen me uh, manually pick and place about 100 0402s on each board and then uh, get the whole thing reflowed at the oven. And then after that, Susan helped me graciously with 
reworking them and getting them into a state where I could then plug them into the pie and bring them up this morning. So uh, this is how the whole thing looks, freshly baked at the, at the Supercon. On the right-hand side, you can see the stencil jig that you have over there in the, in, the, in the design lab that I repurposed by pasting some extra boards for stenciling. And this is, you know, uh, 10 a.m. at an Airbnb in Pasadena <laughs> with the scope, uh, my MacBook, and four oscilloscope probes uh, just trying to, you know, uh, figure out some last moment stuff, get some captures for you all. So yeah, uh, back here. So one thing that the SMI also has an issue with is that uh, you don't get a steady like a sequence of transfers. So you, so, so you can have like, you know, some jitter in between. And that's because, you know, the bus isn't stable or like you have contentions and all. How do we fix this? I have a fix, but I haven't tested it right now. So uh, the Pi has two DMA engines, the DMA Lite and, and the DMA40. The DMA40 are the, like the huge ones that the PCI Express and the other interfaces use. Uh, so I figured out, could I use them for myself? Turns out they were all in use, but I looked at the device tree and I figured out that uh, the two HDMI ports are using one DMA each. So I said, uh, why not uh, just have one HDMI port and uh, uh, just disable the other HDMI port on the Pi and free up a DMA for myself. And, uh, and then, well, I just did boot config TXT, did disable one of the HDMI ports, and when I saw on the scope, we were doing much better, but I got all zeros when I read out the data. The thing is, uh, when you're using a DMA40, you have to give a different physical address than the 32-bit address that you use for the DMA light engines. So for this, you need to go and modify the kernel driver. I did not have time for that so far. I'm gonna try it out and see if it fixes it. So the other thing is, how do you know if you are really getting what you are sampling? You, you wanna make sure that you know data is getting out from one place to another intact. So uh, let's generate a test pattern. There's limited space on the Pico, so we can't really pack a four gigabyte waveform. What we can do is we can use some pseudo random number generators. We have the known same seed on the Pi and the Pico. We'll use a maximum length linear feedback shift register with a 32 bit polynomial. So uh, we can just run the loop, generate as many samples as we can, and push it across and compare. So what did I get? Uh, can I click this? Okay, I cannot. So 20 megahertz, we passed. 41 megahertz right now, we do pass for short runs, but it destabilizes it at higher, you know, uh, higher runs. And this was tough to debug back in India because I had a one giga sample per second scope, and a second I switched to four channels, it would like go by four. So I bought a Rigol here, and uh, to debug this, and uh, that's what I'm gonna, go, gonna take home and figure out. Uh, so uh, signal and data integrity, that was what I was working with before. <laughs> uh, 100 megahertz signals and ground return paths are not as the best thing there. So now with a proper PCB, these are the kind of signals that I'm getting. They seem to be okay. But I just need to go look at the timing screen further and you know, try, to, try to like figure out the last mile stuff in here. So data does pass over from the Pico to the Pi, uh, but you, know, you can see that there are some like aberrations in here. For example, this is the expected uh, waveform pattern that we expect, and this is what we get from the SMI. So wherever you see a red mark is where uh, something has been missed. So you can see there are like some zero zeros in between. So uh, my speculation as of now is that I drive the pins to input too soon and maybe uh, it doesn't have so much of an opportunity to, to uh, sample the data. So I'm gonna try to figure out some timings and see you know, like the PIO, tweak the timings there and figure out how I can get it working. The other thing is flow control. So right now my aim was to like kind of like get it at the 
fastest possible sample rate because you can scale down from there. But then if you, if you want to do slower sample rates, it's even more difficult because you have the interface running at a constant speed and you want some kind of flow control to make sure uh, that the CPU does not have to like step in between. In order to do that, uh, the Pi, the SMI has some bit of uh, functionality that is even more hidden and undocumented <laughs> than uh, what I have tried so far. This is called the DREC and the DREC ACK. There are like, you know, just like a couple of lines about, written about it in the data sheet. The Pico is supposed to pull the DREC high and then the OES gets pulled low. And then uh, DREC is supposed to go low and then the transfers are going to stall until DREC gets pulled high again. So in order to kind of orchestrate this very precisely, I haven't been able to figure it out yet, but I'm working on it and I hope that you know, by in, a, in some time I'll be able to get through it. So uh, what is the future of this entire thing? So uh, to be honest, this idea wasn't of this year. This is something I happened uh, to have since the last year. And uh, last year, uh, I uh, happened to think about, you know, uh, something called as an open source framework for instrumentation. Because I was thinking about, you know, how can I uh, extend Beagle logic and make sure, you know, any available SBC in the market can potentially be an instrument you can utilize. Be it the Raspberry Pi, be it a BeagleBone, be it like a different family of the BeagleBone. Like anything, you run uh, one software that uh, gives you all the instruments you need. Or if you have an instrument, how, do you, how can you get that accessible over the network via some kind of like a RPC protocol? Because SCPI and other things do exist, but uh, they are not maybe as modern as we want. Like things have progressed much, much far ahead. So, I have been working on this like gRPC server and client architecture. So there's like a proto defined, there are some messages basically of like how can instruments be specified, what data they can ex exchange between each other. And then uh, uh, basically that becomes a foundation on which you can have any instrument that you can expose over the network via a, an RPC or like a, we a web interface. So uh, instruments like the Pi or the Beagle Logic, they can possibly be just exposed right away because they already have internet built in. But if you have an instrument that does not have internet built in that just runs via USB, maybe you can plug it in to do a computer, have a server run on that computer that connects to that kind of thing via USB, and then that server will potentially expose the same thing over the same protocol that you can reuse. And then I would like to have client support for SIGROC and NGSCO client because they're like the most open source implementations available and uh, that's where the future is. Uh, look for announcements soon. Uh, I hope to have something on this over the next few months. Uh, what about the Pi 5? So Pi 5 has the Cortex M3 inside it. We have the FIFOs connected on PCI Express, which is a nice thing. Uh, like, like we had Cortex M0 over SWD, possibly Cortex M3 would have some kind of an interface with the kernel or like the memory bus, which they haven't exposed to us yet. Uh, we can uh, compile firmware on the Pi, upload it on the core, control the core for sampling, the same way we are doing right now. Uh, we had the DMA, so maybe like share some kernel driver interfaces. Uh, and if somebody from RPI watches this, uh, I like to try it out, so let me know. Yeah, uh, that's it for my talk. Thank you, everyone, for uh, listening. Uh, my website is kumarabhishek.me. I have another website, which is called the Embedded Kitchen. Uh, I named it so because the idea was, you know, uh, like, uh, like you bake uh, food, you can bake circuits, and, you know, here's a chef who can big circuits. So uh, that was a site I started back in 2014. It's mostly an archive now that I want to keep going forward. Uh, but uh, this latest site was earlier a static implementation. It's now running Ghost. I just inaugurated it this morning. 
do subscribe if you want to receive updates on this project and any future projects. The opt-in is properly configured yet, some email, DNS stuff and all. So the things may land in spam. So check it out. And uh, yeah, do stay in touch. Uh, thank you so much for listening. This is a privilege I don't take lightly, uh, coming here all the way, um, talking about what I've done so far. And um, I'm really grateful to, to, to be here, to interact with you all. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs>